Our scripture reading today is from the book of Genesis, chapter 16, verses 10 through 13. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that there, they will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of all his brothers. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God who sees, for she said, have I even remained alive here after seeing him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Is this on? Oh, there it is. Let's pray. Father, great and awesome God, as we come to this time to hear from you, we pray that we would indeed hear from you, that we would hear your words of life alone and not man's wisdom. We pray that we would also be people who are not just mere hearers of your word, but doers of your word as well. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Good morning, Oakland Presbyterian Church. It's good to see you. Thank you for having me. I've actually wanted to preach here for many, many years now. My kids both went through preschool several years ago at this point. Uh, and I remember... Uh, coming to a couple of services even back then, uh, I believe Pastor Bob was here standing in a lectern. I've, I've preached every once in a while, you know, in, in other places and stuff. And I'm a mover, which you're going to find out. And I would watch Bob up in this, in this uh, pulpit here. And I'm like, how in the world can that dude stand so still and talk? I can't do it. I got I to I gotta have room. I got I to gotta move around. Uh, I, I, I am not... Pastor Craig, as you may have noticed, he is suffering for Jesus in Scotland, where there is no sun, and uh, doing the Lord's work there. I thought I would introduce myself to you guys, since this is the first time I've had a chance to preach to you. And then I thought, you know, it would take so long to tell you where I'm from, and where I'm at, and where I'm going, that that would eat up a whole lot of the sermon time. And I was told I only had an hour to preach anyway. <laughs> that, you're laughing. That is not accurate. It, it's an hour for, for the whole service. Is that what it is? Well, see, so that, that's, that's going to complicate things. So, uh, so let's leave it like this. I'll just tell you my name. It's Russell Williams. And uh, we'll go from there. Although that doesn't do you any good. It doesn't help you know who I am or really anything about me. The last time I checked, Russell means red like a fox. I am not red, although sometimes when my kids irritate me, I can show a little bit of color. And I'm not like a fox. I used to be more like a fox like 20 years ago. Those were the days. But even then, I wasn't too much like a fox. I was like a fox that, uh, that, that went into a hen house, and there was a coyote already in the hen house. And the coyote attacked the fox and threw the fox out of the hen house. And then the fox fell down a hill and hit a whole bunch of rocks on the way down. That's as close to a fox as I've ever gotten. So it doesn't do you any good to know that my name means like a fox. It doesn't tell you anything about me. But then you might say, oh, but your last name's Williams. So I know that's short for Williamson. So that means at some point in your family lineage, there was a William who had a son. And you're wrong. Because my dad was adopted. And so Williams isn't even his biological surname. So me telling you my name has now given you zero information about me because that's not really what names do, right? According to Merriam-Webster, names are just identification of individuality within a collective. What that means is it's how you get somebody's attention in a group. That's it. If we're walking down a hallway and it's just you and me and I say, hey, you, you know I'm talking to you. And if you say, hey, you, I know you're talking to me. If we get into a bigger group, then names come in really handy. If I said, hey, you, right now, nobody's going to know who I'm talking to. I need to use your name. And so with the absence of a group, 
I'm a hey you. In the, abs- in, in, in the assembly of a group, I'm Russell. In a group of Russells, I'm Russell Williams. And in a group of Russell Williams, I am a Russell middle name redacted Williams. That's how we just tell who, who we are. We are individuals within a collective. That's what names do. That's why Shakespeare can say that a rose by any other name still smells as sweet because the name itself doesn't give a characteristic to the rose. The rose is something else apart from its name. However, it's not always been like that, right? Long, long time ago in the Bible days, especially in the Old Testament Bible days when they wrote things in Hebrew and sometimes in Aramaic, Uh, In the Bible, a name correctly describes a person, place, or object, and it indicates the essential character of it. So what that means is when you read through the Old Testament, like in Isaiah, God tells Isaiah, hey, Isaiah, you're about to have some kids. I want you to name those kids some really weird names. And so Isaiah says, sure, what do I got to lose? It's not my name. I'll name my kid that. They can hate me for the rest of their life. It doesn't really matter. And he names his kid really weird names, and they all have something to do, though, with what God is doing or planning to do. You go on over and some other prophets like Hosea. Hosea marries Gomer. That doesn't go too well for for Hosea. Uh, And he has some children, and God says, hey, I want you to name this kid this particular thing. We even see it a little bit in the New Testament when they tell them that he's going to call his name Jesus because he's going to save his people because Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew, and which means salvation. So in the Old Testament, people name everything. and They, they, they like to name places where they dig water, uh, wells, right? And they name those places, and you get names like Bethel, the house of God, or, or God's room, and things like that. So in our scripture today, we find that there is a name of God. And anytime we have a name of God where a human is ascribing to God a name, what we find is we find that it is the infinite trying to communicate something about itself to the finite. You you and I need to understand we are finite beings. We are not eternal beings. Let's use some some, uh, geometry to help us understand this, okay? So here we go. Think, if you will, of a dot. There's the dot right there. There's a little bit of a line, and then there's another dot. Now that is a line segment. It has a beginning, and it has an end. Most people consider that's what life is. Most people consider I am a line segment. I have a beginning. I am going to have an end. That is very obvious, except that's not exactly the way it is. And so there's, there's another option there in, in geometry. You have a dot, and then you have a line coming off of that dot, but that line's actually an arrow, and it goes all the way in one direction, right? And that line, that's called a ray, and it has a beginning, but it never, ever has an end. That's what we call everlasting, and that's what you are. That's what I am. We are everlasting beings, no matter what happens to you at the end of this life. No matter if you go up or down, No matter which place you end up in, it lasts forever. And so we are everlasting beings. We have a beginning, but we don't have an end. But that does not make us infinite, even though we don't have an end. See, with God, God's something different from the line segment. He's different from a ray. God is a line that has an arrow going that way and an arrow going that way. And that in geometry is a line. It has no ending there. It has no ending there. He is thus eternal. He is infinite. You can't get to the beginning. You can't get to the end. And so we as finite people, even though we are everlasting, can never know all that there is to know about an infinite God. Even after we die and get to heaven, guess what? We're still going to be learning things about God. 10,000 years into heaven, we're still going strong, but we still are finite, and God is still infinite, and so we will still be learning things about God. But that infinite God wants us to know about himself. And so within Scripture, he gives us glimpses. We can't know everything, but there are some things that we can know and we can know for certain. And here in this Scripture, he says this. He says uh, in Genesis 16, 13, this this is Hagar. This is in the middle of a really weird story. 
Abraham, whose name is Abram at this point because his name hasn't changed to Abraham yet, but Abraham was told he was going to have a kid. But Abraham said, uh, God, I'm a little old for this. And God said, don't worry, I, I can do this thing. And then his wife Sarah, whose name was Sarai at this point because her name wasn't changed to Sarah, says, uh, hey, I'm pretty old too. I don't think I want to go through this. Let's have you take my handmaid Hagar and you guys can have relations and then you can have a child with her. And for some reason, Abraham thought this was a good idea. I mean, what could possibly go wrong in any of this? And so Abraham had relations with Hagar. Hagar ends up with child. Sarah doesn't like it. Well, of course she doesn't like it. It was her idea to begin with, but now she's got issues with it. So she tells Abraham, Abraham, you deal with this woman. And Abraham says, this was not my idea. You deal with the woman. She's your handmaid. And so Sarah says, fine, I'll deal with it. And she's really, really mean. She's cruel to Hagar. And so Hagar leaves. She runs away. And in the middle of her running away, God shows up. And he says, hey, uh, where are you coming from? Where are you going? What are you doing? Why are you here? I got, I got some blessings I want to give you. And I've got some things I need you to hear about your child and, and the things that are going to happen with your child. And so God tells her all of that. And after she meets with God, she says this. She calls the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God who sees. El Roy. Now, I am not fluent in conversational ancient Hebrew. So I am not 100% sure that it is pronounced Roy. But the best that a kid from Tennessee can do is to say Roy. And so she calls his name El Roy, and El Roy means that you are a God who sees. And so, El Roy, the God who sees, that, that El is short for Elohim. It's just a term, it's a general term for God. You guys understand that when we say God, that's not God's name. It's like my kids calling me dad. Dad is not my name. Dad is just a title. Right? And so when we say God, we're not really calling God by his name. We're, we are referring to him as his title, God. Elohim in the Old Testament, just like that, actually used for other gods as well, but with, with God. So anytime you see in the Old Testament, you see names that either start with E-L or end with E-L, they're all talking about God in some way because that's the shortened form of Elohim. So you have Daniel right? Daniel is the God who judges. You have Samuel. Samuel is the God who hears. And so anytime you're reading through scripture and you come across a name, especially in the Old Testament, that ends or starts with E-L, it's saying something about God. So what we're told about God here is he is a God who roys. He sees. Now that word roy, R-O-I, the very root of that word, it's R-H. Raha? Maybe? Eh. I don't know how to say it. It's like Latin. Not a whole lot of people around here talking, you know. But it is R apostrophe H when it's transliterated. Now, it appears throughout the Old Testament. It's, it's not just here in the scripture. And so we can get from how it's used in other, in other places in the Bible, we can get to a good meaning of what Roy is, right? And so Genesis 3, 6, it's used to describe physical sight. Eve's sitting around a tree that she shouldn't have been anywhere around, and she looks at it, and she sees that it's good for food. So it's physical sight. Over in Numbers, which is another wild story, it's about a dude named Balaam who goes on a ride on a donkey who can apparently talk and see angels that Balaam can't see who stand in his way with a sword because he's going to kill him. It's a wild story. You should look it up sometimes. But Balaam is a prophet of God. And Balaam has a vision, and he gives this vision, and this vision is of Jesus. And in Numbers 24, 17, Balaam says, I see him but not yet. Still afar off. And he's talking about Jesus. And he says, ah, he's coming. Here he comes. 
but it's still gonna take a while. And so he sees him in a, in a, in a vision in the, in, the, in the mind's eye, right? Uh, it means becoming aware of Genesis 16, which is the chapter we're in now, when Sarah finds out that Hagar is with child. She becomes aware of the fact that she is with child. And it's the same root word that is used in, in that. In Psalm 1610, prophecy of Jesus. And it says, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Other translations translate that. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption in the grave. It means to experience something. And in that instance, Jesus is not going to experience corruption in the grave. What's he going to do? He's going to come out three days later. If you haven't read that part, I'm sorry to spoil it for you. But he does. He comes out of the grave three days later. And so there's experience in this. And then in Genesis 39, 23, it's the story of Joseph. Joseph, man, not a great guy, right? He's, he, he's not good to his brothers. And his brothers aren't good to him either. Everybody's at fault here. But he gets sold into slavery. He does okay for himself in slavery, but then some things happen. Not really his fault. He was doing the right thing, but he gets put in jail anyway. But while he's in jail, he gets put over other people in the jail. And in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 23, this word is used by the jail keeper. And it says that the jail keeper no longer needed to oversee anything that Joseph was in charge for. He did not need to look after it. He did not need to care for it anymore. And so throughout the Old Testament, we see this root word that we get our word Roy from there. And we see that it means physical sight, a vision, becoming aware of, experience, and caring for. And so all of these things are things that God is trying to get across to us within our language so that we can understand that about him. And so here's what we need to understand is that God sees us. God sees you. God sees me, and we are a people who desperately want to be seen. We do so much to be seen. The problem is that most of the time we only want to be seen in the way we wish others to see us. And we don't wish to be seen in the way that we truly are. And so, man, we will post every stinking lunch we have on Facebook or Instagram. Please look at me. We will take 50 pictures of our children, 49 of which, they're all acting like little hellions. But one of them, they come out right. And so we're going to post that because we want to be seen. But we only want to be seen in the way we wish to be seen. And we're desperate. We're desperate to be seen, but there's fear there, right? Because being seen when it's paired with mistrust feels like being exposed. And that's what happened all the way back in the garden, right? Adam and Eve, they're just bebopping around. They're having a good old time. Nothing's wrong. Everything's good. And then they decide they know better than God. And they eat of the fruit. And then all of a sudden, whoa, uh, I see you seeing me. And I don't like to be seen like this. And now I feel exposed. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to cover up. I'm going to hide, right? And I'm going to take some fig leaves. I'm going to sew fig leaves together. And I'm going to hide myself from you because I don't trust you. And I don't trust that you're going to look at me and love me. And so they hide from each other. But then that's not enough because God's coming. And they got to hide from God, but God's a lot bigger and the clothes aren't working too much. And so what do they do? They jump in a bush to hide from God. Because we fear being exposed. Because we mistrust the eyes that are looking at us. Over in the book of Hebrews. It's a long way from Genesis. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 says, There's no creature hidden from God's sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him. Hey, that is not, that is not a pleasant thought, is it? 
that you and I are laid bare before God. That there is nothing hidden. Because you know what goes on in my head? I bet it's the same thing that goes on in your head. They're not going to love me if they knew. They knew the things that I thought. They knew the things that I desired. They knew the things that I did. They know who I really am. They will not love me. I cannot trust them. I have to hide. But in my hiding, I desperately, desperately want to be seen. And so I wear a mask. And so I pretend. And so I lie. So I show up on Sunday mornings and smile and say everything's fine. God sees. And God sees through it all. But the good part about that is that there is freedom when we can trust the heart of God. When we see God for who he is, and he gives us, he gives us a vision of himself. That's part of it, right? We not, we not, or we're not only seen by God, but God lets us see him. And when we see him the way the scripture describes him, then here's what we understand. We understand that we have a God who says there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We know that we have a God who, who convinced John to write in 1 John chapter 4, there is no fear in perfect love. That perfect love casts out fear because fear involves judgment. Because we can trust the heart of God. Because why? Because God first loved us. See, God loves us. It's not a romantic type of love. You guys understand that romantic love is, is blind and stupid. It is, it is a chemical reaction in your brain designed to make you make bad decisions. That's what romantic love is. And we will, we will fall for the worst people. And, 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 and when we do, we will excuse so much stuff. But what we're really doing is we're loving in ignorance, not loving in knowledge. And God does not love any of us in ignorance because we are all laid bare before him. God looks at you and God looks at me full in the face, knowing every thought I've ever had, knowing every action that I've ever taken, knowing every desire of my heart, every evil intent, everything about me. And God says, I choose to love you. That is agape love. That is the love of John 3.16. That is the love of 1 Corinthians 13 that believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That is the love that sent Jesus to the cross so that knowing you, seeing you, seeing me for what we truly are, the only being that has ever truly seen us so that he could have a relationship with us so God sees us. And it, if we can trust the heart of God, if we can bring ourselves to trust the heart of God, then it is a comforting, freeing knowledge because we know that it's grace, right? There's grace and there's mercy. And so God sees us. God lets us see him. He doesn't leave us to our own devices. He puts himself out in nature. As Romans chapter 1 says that all of nature declares his invisible attributes, Right? But even more than nature, he gives a specific revelation in Scripture. And so he gives us visions of himself. He allows us to see him. Becoming aware of things is a little, eh, when, when it comes to God. God. God is omniscient. He knows everything. He's always known everything. There's never a time where he hasn't known everything. And so technically, God never becomes aware. God never learns because he's always known. Some people talk about how God knows all possibilities of all possible worlds. Right? He, he, there's just, he just never actually becomes. And so when we talk about becoming aware, we just mean that God is aware of everything. God is aware of every side of every story. Even the stories 
that your wife might tell that's supposed to go this way, but then they go that way, and then they take off that way, and then three days later she comes back with the same thing coming this way, and you're like, what are you talking about? Don't you remember I told you this? Other? No, I don't remember that. Even if it's not a straightforward story, God knows every side to it. And, you know, we, we like to say, oh, there's two sides to every story. Most stories have way more than two sides. That just means that God knows. God knows what makes that conservative person that you can't stand conservative. God knows what makes that liberal person that you can't stand liberal. God knows the person that doesn't like the same football team that you like, like that other football team. God knows what makes your wife do the things that drive you crazy. God knows why your husband does the things that he does that drive you crazy. God knows why you have problems with your kids. God knows why your kids have problems with you. God knows why you have problems within the church. He knows the reason behind all of it. He is aware of all of the reasonings. And so he is a right judge when he does judge. Experience, he fills our pain. And that's not just a slogan. Back over in Hebrews chapter 4 again, it says that he is our high priest who is sympathetic with us. Why is he sympathetic with us? Because he experienced temptation every way that we experience temptation. In the New Testament, it says this, that there are three things within this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. All temptations fall up under one of those three things. It was one of those three things, or those three things that Eve saw at the beginning, and she messed up, and Adam messed up, and then... <clears throat> Over in Luke chapter 4, in the Gospels, Jesus goes out in the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And guess what pops up again? That's right, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. They pop right on up again. Those are the three ways that Jesus is tempted. And this time, Jesus is able to accomplish what Adam and Eve couldn't accomplish. And he makes it through all of the temptation. But then it says that Satan leaves him and waits for another opportune time to tempt him again. So it wasn't like a one and done thing. And so scripture tells us that Jesus is sympathetic with us because he has experienced the temptation as we have experienced that temptation. We don't have a high priest who isn't sympathetic with us. And then lastly there, it's caring for. That God watches out for us. What do the gospels say? Have you considered the lilies of the valley? Have you considered the, the sparrows that are sold for a penny? Not one of them fall that God hasn't taken, taken a notice of. How much more so is he going to take care of you? And so he cares for us. And man, that was a really good sermon you say to yourself. I was like, awesome. Except it can't be over just knowing things about God. It's not enough just to hear the word. It's not enough just to know things. It's got to be applied to our life. And so we can't just say that, oh, we serve a God who sees. We have to be a people who see as well. And so we have to ask ourselves these things. Do we see others? I'm going to tell you, the, the answer is no, I don't. I pull up to a corner and a panhandler standing out there, you know what I do? I look the other way. I bet. I don't see because I don't look. There are things in this world that are complicated. There are things in this world that are too heavy for me to carry. So I don't look because I don't want to see. I would imagine that you're the same way too. So do we truly see others? Most of the time we don't see, the reason we don't see <clears throat> is because we're too busy looking somewhere else. Most of the time, the place we're looking is at ourselves. But do we see others? Do we let others see us? Oh, vulnerability. I am an introvert. It means I don't like people. No offense. I am good being by myself. I have seen many, many articles about how introverts can interact with people. 
And I always think to myself, why don't they write an article that say, hey, extroverts, 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 why don't you just shut up and sit down? (laughs) Ten ways that extroverts cannot annoy people. That's what I want to see. I like being alone. I am not made to be alone. I am made to be in community, and you are made to be in community as well. And we cannot be in community if we hide ourselves. You don't have to expose, you don't have to expose yourself to anybody. You don't, you don't have to open yourself up to everybody. You don't. But you need somebody. You should be open to your wife. You should be open to your husband. But you need someone else too. You need deep-rooted friendship where they can see you, and you allow them to see you. (sighs) Becoming aware of things. Man, do we reserve judgment, or uh, do we do the opposite of the whole being quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger? Do you seek to fight and to win rather than to understand? Do you seek the knockout blow? Oh, I've got them now. I watched Fox News and I know just what to say. Oh man, I watched CNN and now I got them. Do we reserve judgment until we know all the sides of the story? Do we empathize? I don't like walking in other people's shoes. Most of the time you put somebody else's shoes on, their feet's already like sweated in it, and you put your, and it's just nasty. And then their shoes are always too big. But you gotta, listen, you gotta walk in other people's shoes. You gotta put yourself in their spot. We have to see them and understand, try to understand their pain. The best, the best, man, the best example I ever heard of this was uh, it's a guy named Brandon Manning. He wrote it in a book, and he was talking about a guy who got on a bus early in the morning, and he gets on the bus with his two kids, and he sits down, and his kids start going wild, and there's a guy, another guy on the bus. He's like, what in the world is going on with these kids? And as the bus keeps going down the road, the guy is getting madder and madder and madder at, at, at the kids and, until finally he just blows up. He's like, why aren't you doing something with your kids? Why can't you control them? Why can't you be a better parent? To which the guy replies, you know what, you're right. We just left the hospital and my wife has passed and I just don't know what to do with my kids. And he said, ah, that's the beginning of compassion, seeing where your enemy cries. That's the beginning of empathy, putting yourself in their place feeling their pain, the very thing that Jesus has done for us. And then do you care for others? Do I care for others? I mean, I care about my own, right? But do I care for others? Because God surely cares for us. Now that is a tall order. That is a very tall order, and I, 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 don't, I don't reach up to it, Right? I certainly can't do it within my own power. I certainly can't force myself into it. And that's the state of the human population. Nobody can. That's why Jesus died. Jesus died not only to give us grace and to forgive us when we can't meet these, but Jesus died so that we might have his spirit live within us that will absolutely help us accomplish the things that he desires for us to accomplish and make us more like him. And so we need to be people who not only know that we serve a God who sees, but we need to be people who see ourselves. Let's pray. Father, great and awesome God, I pray as your eye is on us that you open our eyes to others. In Christ's name we pray, amen.